You know, say what you want about this book, but the fact remains that ever since the year 2001, same shit, different day, that has entered my daily dialogue. Hey, what's up, bookworms and constant readers? We are back, ready to go into the multiverse. And today, guys, 2001's Dreamcatcher, a nice little science fiction horror romp, I guess you would call it, by Cy King. Now, this book is kind of legendary for a couple of reasons. This is his first book post-accident. If you guys don't know, Stephen King was taking a walk and got hit by a car and almost died while he was recovering. He was on, I forget what actual painkiller it was, but basically it was too hard to sit at a typewriter. So he actually wrote this book longhand while he was in bed. So how about that? That's an incredible story in its own. But this is one that I read on release day when it did come out, ate it up in a couple of days because to me, I had accepted when the story first broke that he was dead and he was never going to write again. So to me, no matter what he put out next, it was going to be appointment reading for me, even though it already was kind of at that point. But guys, this is one of Stephen King's most maligned books, especially by constant readers. You routinely see it at the very bottom of a lot of King fans' lists. And I'm going to kind of talk about if I think that's justified or not. So this is one I read on release day, like I said, but I read it again this past April to reread and let you guys know before we head into the multiverse. But let's go ahead and start things off, guys, by talking about what is Dreamcatcher about. Well, in Derry, Maine, four young boys once stood together and did a brave thing. Something that changed them in ways they hardly understand. A quarter of a century later, the boys are men who have gone their separate ways. Though they still get together once a year to go hunting in the north woods of Maine. But this time is different. This time, a man comes stumbling into their camp, lost, disoriented, and muttering about lights in the sky. Before long, these old friends will be plunged into the most remarkable event of their lives as they struggle with a terrible creature from another world. Their only chance of survival is locked in their shared past and in the Dreamcatcher, guys. This goes all the way back to 2001 here. This is Dreamcatcher. Now with this one, guys, there's lots to talk about when it comes to the good and bad because this is a very mixed book, but I'm going to get into the usual. I'm going to start talking about the good first. So with me, guys, you know, coming of age, that's my favorite, favorite thing that Stephen King does. And he does that here. He does it with five different people. So this is set in Derry. So of course you're going to have uh, alternating timelines, you know, with the, uh, with the, with the youth and the adulthood. Does that, does that ring a bell at all? Does that sound familiar? Yes. It does feel very much like we're taking another stroll with the Losers Club and it. That's very much what the setting feels like. But I think it's really, really great because King continues to be the master, the master of all time when it comes to not only writing coming of age, but writing the way that boys talk to each other. Yes. Downright to their crude discussions that they do have. There's a chapter in here where they're just trying to talk up they're talking about finding a picture of a girl's hoo-ha yes it it, it it doesn't feel forced it feels like yeah that's the way stupid preteen boys who have no idea what they're talking about did talk in the time period so i again uh king will he will rub some people the wrong way when it comes to stuff like that but to me it makes it very real because that is the way that preteen boys do talk to each other here but uh i think this really does feel like it could be the generation like after the losers club you know i say after the losers club fought and defeated Pennywise. These are just like some outcasts, you know, kind of different. They had come from all different walks of life and they all come together and they join forces to kind of fight this greater thing, right? So it feels like the hat tips are all there. To, uh, I don't feel like it's quite as derivative of it as a lot of people. I mean, of course, like I said, you're dealing with both jumping back and forth in time between their youth and their adulthood and it takes place in Maine and there's something supernatural-ish going on. Not really. It's more science fiction, I think, as you are dealing with aliens. But, you know, if you've read it, you know, you know. But with me, uh, yeah, it does feel like it could take place in that same kind of time period. But since this is dairy, you know, weird things are going to pop off at all times. And uh, weird shit goes down even post Pennywise in dairy. So he writes young boys dialogue so well, like I talk about. But showing them as damaged adults uh, with real life problems is, is just up to, you know, the expectations for King. I feel like he writes a little bit of himself into a few of the characters here. You know, there's a little bit of him. He always does this. He'll always write a little bit of himself in them. But obviously, he was going through this this new life situation where he had been just totally destroyed by getting hit by a vehicle. And that happens to Jonesy in the story. So he writes some of himself, I think, into Jonesy 
Pete battles with his sobriety. You know, obviously King's been battling that for years, uh, or lack thereof. But uh, you know, King's actually been sober for a long time. But you know, I still think that it's something that it's a battle that you're always having, even though you're sober. You know, Henry suffers from depression, suicidal tendencies, things like that. Uh, so I feel like there's a little bit of everything. Maybe even Beaver, if you want to say he just like, has a really, really bad potty mouth, which King clearly does. <laughs> you know, so I, I think that there's lots of things that he's able to write into all these characters that he can relate to in his real life. He likes to write about what's going on in his life or his past experiences or what he thinks his life could have been with a few different choices. And uh, that, that's really cool. But he also continues to write mental and health issues into his characters. I'm talking about Duddits in this, who suffers from Down syndrome. And I think it's one of those things that he's just always done well. Ever since Dark Tower, he's always kind of tackled these kinds of things, damaged characters up to and including, you know, mental issues. You know, I think that that's something that he's always been really, really great at. And he continues to do it here. And it just makes this group just feel so unique and so original to me and not just a, a straight carbon copy of the Losers Club because, you know, they are all very different. Now, I will say, I do feel like this could have been like some leftover characters that he had over that he had to cut out of Losers Club because he's kind of been like, you know what, seven, seven characters might be enough. I don't think I can do 12. It does kind of feel like that. You know, even though I think that Beaver might feel a little bit more like Richie Tozier, I guess. So that might be like a little bit of a, a, a comparison there. But again, I don't know if that's what it is. I'm saying that's what it feels like. That's what it feels like to me. This could have been some of those characters, like they were extras that got cut out of the Losers Club. So the first half of the book, guys, Pete King, just great stuff. Coming of age, damaged adults, horror ambiance. Guys, this book has one of the best buildups and sense of dread. The moment that McCarthy shows up, this book has a sense of dread I had not felt in a long time in one of his books. It was really, really well done. Up to, I'd say, Beaver and the Toilet Lid. Again, if you know, you know. I don't want to get too much into spoilers here, but up until the part where Beaver's on the Toilet Lid, I think this is some of the best stuff, horror stuff, that he has written in years at this point. Really, really great. And the tension is just palpable. It's amazing. I, I, I just love it so much at this point. But that kind of takes me to the not so good parts of this book, guys. And that's because this that, that's where I feel like the book really, really peaked for me. I love the coming of age stuff. I love the four friends getting back together, reconciling and talking about their lives and not really letting each other know, you know, hey, I've got the, like one guy, Henry, he's suffering. You know, he wants to kill himself, basically, you know. So these guys all share like this mental link and it doesn't really explain that. It will eventually, but it's one of those things where like they don't know this about each other, you know, and it, they all get the kind of this feeling, you know, be extra careful today. I've got a bad feeling and stuff like that. And they keep referencing Duddits and you kind of get to know a little bit more at a time. But for me, the book starts to go downhill the moment that Kurtz is introduced. Now, Kurtz, he's just... I don't know. He, he just feels like a different book once he shows up. And I feel like I've talked about this several times with his books in the 90s and early 2000s. I feel like he has this thing where it feels like two books mashed together. Like at the middle of the book, he watched something, he watched some movie, he watched some documentary or something. He said, hmm, how do I fit that into the story that I'm writing right now? A uh, big one was Rose Matter. That was a comparison I made where it was like he was writing this domestic abuse story and all of a sudden he watched this, this biography on Greek mythology and said, oh, how do I put that into my story? You know, So that could be wrong. He could have always planned to go that way, but that's just what it feels like. And with Kurtz, it's just like he's introduced too late and then we spend too much time with them. And I feel like the whole time you're with Kurtz and Underhill, I just want to get back to my uh, my group of friends. You know, I want to know what's going on with them. You know, so I feel like a, a book like this, you know, you have your, you say your antagonist is your alien species, but I feel like you got to have your human antagonist as well. Because what does King always do? He always says that the humans are worse than the actual monsters in his story. And Kurtz, he, he's a baddie. He's, he is a real baddie. But the thing is, he's, he's so over the top evil that it almost, I have a hard time kind of just taking him seriously, really. But uh, yeah, I think the idea of the aliens is good, but the execution is poor a little bit. I do like the idea of them like telling people, oh, you know, we're just, I don't, I'm just a little girl. I don't know what to do with these dragons. You know, they're kind of give that little, like, like the, the simpering little Daenerys trick. You know, that's how I kind of feel like they do here. They're just like, oh, you know, we're just, we're just sweet little babies, you know, because we can look innocent. And, you know, they're, they're these bloodthirsty maniacs, I think. But I, I, I don't know. I, again, I feel like, Anytime King messes with aliens, it seems like it starts strong and then it just kind of veers off the rails a little bit. And that does seem to be the case here. Dud is essentially missing from the entire part of the adult story 
for so long and it didn't quite have the payoff that you'd want. At least I felt that way. I did feel like when you do get that payoff, because they had like this big lingering mystery about, you know, Duddits and about how this is why they're all here. And, you know, just talking about this event with Duddits and you never really know what exactly it is. And then I feel like you do get that moment. It, it just didn't hit as hard for me as I feel like an amazing character like character writer like King would be able to do. You feel like you were just waiting for that moment. But when it happens, it, to me, it just... I don't know. It feels like it waited, he waited too long. Again, you, you waited too long to introduce your villain, and then you spent too much time with him, and you waited too long to do the payoff of what the deal was with Duddit. So that's that's with me. It's, it, this one's just kind of weird because, again, you're dealing with us. You would think it's the part with the preteen boys that this would be in, but it's not. And it's part of the storyline. Don't get me wrong. So it isn't just for fun, but just going into the farting so much just gets ridiculous after a while. Or it's like, okay, all right. Well, it's I get it. I, I do get it, but that, that that a lot of people have been like, the only thing I remember about that book is aliens and farting, and you know what? You're not wrong, but it's just another book that I think feels about 100 pages too long. The story that he's telling here, I don't feel like it needs to be this long, and the fact that he wrote this longhand, that's amazing to me because that's a lot of writing, but I do feel like it could have been a little shorter. Probably could have changed the narrative flow a bit, introduced Kurtz much, much earlier than he did. And I think it probably would have been better for it. It wouldn't feel like you're taking away from the characters that I want to know about. But it's way too long to introduce the human villain and then spend too much time with them. And the friends, they might seem a little derivative of it. I mean, it's going to be hard for you and Derry, again, dealing with these group of kids and some of them outcasts and things like that all different walks of life, having different kind of home lives and things like that, and going back and forth between their youth and their adulthood, it's going to it's gonna make you think, oh, yeah, I like this better when you did it. And it this kind of feels like great value. It. it might feel like that to some people. Like I said, I felt like the characters were different enough. The time period, the setting was different enough that didn't feel like that. But when you're dealing with dairy as well, it's gonna be it's gonna be hard, especially when there are several references. Not several. There's like there's a couple of references to the Losers Club. But how about why you should read it, guys? This was actually kind of tough because I feel like uh, everybody just has low expectations of this book. So I feel like if you go in with those low expectations, maybe you won't be quite disappointed. I think if you go in with the expectations of just like, look, King was in a transition. Obviously, he had some serious life changes at this point. And it was kind of different. And whenever he deals with aliens, I mean, you're either going to be on board or you're not. If you didn't like what he did in Tommy Knockers, I don't know necessarily that you're going to like what he does here. You know, it's it's one of those things that's it's hard to do it serious because it can really uh, devolve into camp if you're not careful. And sometimes it does do that. I think that the grays are quite scary in a lot of places and quite ridiculous in others. So again, like I said, I like the ideas of them, but I feel like the execution doesn't quite get pulled off that much. But again, if you like alien stories, you like King just going completely, you know, just all in, just going for it. I think I think you'll you'll find something to like there. If you like good coming of age, that's all in here. You like a good slow build into the horror of the situation, it's got a really good one. As far as after that build finally hits its climax, well, you still like it. That's kind of what, that just kind of depends on you because that does happen at about the halfway point of the book and then it's just a whole different thing so again i feel like it does feel like two books kind of mash into one and you don't mind king chonkers i think you'll be fine uh but i feel like if you are a king you read a lot of, a lot of king books this is one of those where i'm like look i wouldn't recommend you your first five to ten stephen king books you read be Dreamcatcher. if it's one of those books where you've read 15 20 king books and you like a lot of them uh yeah sure pick it up you know don't take it too seriously i think you'll probably enjoy it but if you're relatively new to stephen king and you pick this up you're probably gonna be like why is that idiot at mike's book reviews always talking about how great stephen king is i think you might feel like that so i feel like if you know a lot of things that stephen king does and you just you are along for the ride just want to be you're a constant reader at this point i think you'll enjoy it more than not but there are going to be some things where you're like, eh, that's kind of questionable. So it's one of those, I think, if you are a King veteran, yeah, sure, go ahead and pick it up. But, you know, if you're relatively new to King, eh, I'd probably choose one of the greatest hits before I got to this one. As for my final thoughts here, look, first half of this book is superb. I love it. It's on par with some of the greatest things that I love about King. It has your coming of age. It has your great buildup. It has your creepy monster. It has your incredible ambiance. It has his damaged characters. All those things I do like. But the second half, and namely when the friends split up a little bit, I feel like it's just not as good and it never really recovers. I feel like the first half of this book, terrific. Second half of the book, it's a no for me, dog, I think. But look, King is always a mixed bag. Like I said, when dealing with aliens, uh, I, I have a ton of personal nostalgia for this book. Because like I said, because after his accident, I didn't think I was ever going to get 
you know, anything new from him. And I will still, like I said, I still say same shit different day. To this day, I say it all the time. It's, it, I try not to say it as much at work. It's not as professional. But I was like, hey, how you doing? Eh, you know, same shit different day. I, I think it's just something that's always really stuck on me. I love it. It's just one of his things that I just picked up and just add to my vocabulary. And 20 plus years later, here we are. I still say it all the time. And so uh, I, on this reread, I kind of remembered some of the things that I've forgotten. And I think I forgot them because, yeah, they weren't very memorable. The stuff that I remembered was all stuff from the first half of this book. And that stuff was still really, really great. But the reread did show me the warts of the second half of the book. And that's why I say, like, I would still probably read this again before I read Tommyknockers. But I think it's about par with Tommyknockers. I think Tommyknockers goes a little too far in some other places. And, you know, watch that review if you want to know what I mean by it goes a little bit too far. So this book doesn't quite, you know, go over the edge like like Tommy Knockers did. But I do think it's like kind of similar in that I do like the core group of friends here. I did like Guard a lot in Tommy Knockers. And, you know, but the aliens, again, it's just kind of going to depend on what you're looking for, what you like. It's probably not ever going to live up to what you're wanting. But, you know, you want a little bit of, you know, it with some uh, Independence Day kind of mashed in. I think maybe you might have a good time with this. I, I, I don't know. It's kind of really dependent on you. But for me, uh, like I said, uh, I, I would rather I would rather he just kind of stuck to the horror setting and the, and the group of friends and uh, it's the setting is just killer when it works, but when it doesn't, it kind of it kind of wears off about midway for me, and that's kind of what I would say the book would be about midway between uh, you know the the greatest of king and the worst of king. This is not the worst king I've read. I mean, there's there's been some really bad ones, but I mean this would be you know the lower third of his books for me for sure. But again, that first half is some of the best stuff he's written, so it's really. Just almost kind of a tragedy, really. So let's move along, guys, to a couple of the multiverse connections. Uh, I always like to tell people that I don't feel like these are going to kind of spoil anything for you out of context, really. I'm not looking to spoil anything for you, but if you don't know anything about the multiverse at all, I say pause this and come back. When you've read the entire Stephen King bibliography, that's an amazing, amazing feat if you have done it. Uh, obviously, Derry, uh, it's location of its location of Insomnia. Bag of Bones, 11, 22, 63, and many others. Lots of short stories and things like that. At this point, Derry's been used almost as much as Castle Rock, I think, or, or Jerusalem's Lot. It's just it's something that you're always going to kind of say, hey, you know, outside of New Haven, that might be the craziest, craziest place up in Maine. But uh, it obviously is the big one here. There is a plaque that does mention uh, the Losers Club. And there's also some graffiti that says Pennywise Lives. See, now in my memory, there was actually a cameo by some Losers Club characters in this, but I, now that I'm thinking about it, I think that's 11 63 I don't know. When I do that reread, I'll, I'll, I'll revisit that issue. But that was something I was looking for while I was reading this, and it never quite happened. So I was saying, I think maybe I might have got that confused with another book. Uh, Dark Tower is kind of, kind of a weak one, but uh, Bridgeton Pharmacy, uh, it's also seen in Song of Susanna. I think it's actually called King's Pharmacy, which is even fun, but I'm pretty sure it is the same place. And then, look, with this one, guys... Tommy Knockers, this is speculation. This is fan theory. This isn't anything that has been confirmed or denied by King, but a lot of fans do believe that these are the same aliens from Tommy Knockers because there is a moment in the book where they, one of them does say, This is not the first time that we've been on this planet or we've crashed on this planet. And that leads a lot of people to believe that it is the same ones that crash in New Haven. Now, uh, but the thing was with that is like that's their ship that crashed into it. Can't really say. A lot of other people said maybe this is the same species as Pennywise. I don't think so. Uh, but you you get the beginning and you're listing all of those, you know, different UFO sightings over time. I'm thinking that that's just one of these is the explanation for like a Roswell or something like that. That's what these uh, these gray aliens are. So you know, you got the grays and you've got Bob Gray. So a lot of people speculate, oh, that's this that's the species that Pennywise is. Now I think uh, the species that Pennywise, uh, Dandelo from Dark Tower, and uh, God, the, the evil librarian lady from the, the library policeman, can't think of her name at the moment. Uh, I think those might be all kind of tied together there. But again, that's just fan theory, that's speculation, that's nothing that I can say is an actual multiverse connection. But that is what I have, guys. So I, I think that Dreamcatcher is a very, very uh, divisive book. It really is. I, I think that, again, you go into it with low expectations, 
I think you could probably enjoy it. Uh, my wife read it for the first time while I was reading it. She she liked she kind of felt the same way that I did. She really liked the first half. She thought there was some things that she would have changed, but she, overall she enjoyed it. You know, for the most part. But she's you know she's read several King books at this point. So I think if this isn't one of your first like five Stephen King books or so, you're kind of used to his writing style and his his approach. I think you'll have a good time. But you know, don't go to it expecting something great. You can't be disappointed. So hope for the best, expect the worst. It's always a good plan with things like this, guys. But uh, next, I'll be reading. Black House when they said the series for Into the Multiverse here. And this is going to be my first read of Black House, because you know, guys, I did not read The Talisman until a couple of years ago, so obviously I never read Black House. So this will be my first reading of Black House. I should be getting to that in July. I think that's the plan to get the Black House. And, you know, I was I was lukewarm on The Talisman. I thought that it uh, had some neat ideas. Uh, I just wanted it to be a Dark Tower book. I have heard there are things in Black House that kind of retrofit it into a Dark Tower continuum. That's cool if it really does that i don't i don't know if that is actual true or not but all i know is hopefully it won't have richard in it and i will be very very happy man so uh look forward to it guys i look forward to talking to you guys about it i will be doing that uh you know that into the multiverse as soon as i do reread or sorry read black house for the first time and it'll be a reread of from buick 8 after that before we finally get back to the Dark Tower and finish that up. That is the plans for the Into the Multiverse series, guys. So have you read Dreamcatcher? What did you think? Please be honest. It's okay. If you didn't like the book, that's fine. I've met more people that dislike the book than like it. I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. So hit me in the comments, guys, and I will talk to you there. <laughs>